Broadcasting more than 2,000 games live and archived in 15 sports in over 10 counties in western Pennsylvania. As well as being the exclusive home for all the WPIAL playoffs and championships for nearly two decades. Anytime, anywhere, always there. We are the MSA Sports Network. Welcome to This Week in the WPIAL here on the MSA Sports Network. The MSA sports team delivers the most complete preview of this week's top WPIAL football games. Now, here is your host, Don Rebel. This week in the WPIAL on the MSA Sports Network, sponsored in part by Prograss, by UPMC Sports Medicine, by First Commonwealth Bank, by Carlo University, by Officially Sports, by Dollar Bank, by Monticello's Italian Restaurant, and by Management Science Associates. Welcome to this week of the WPIL as we prepare you for week eight of the WPIL football season. Don Rebel, Bob Orquist, Mark Schoss will be joining us shortly. Robert, stretch run has begun. Two weeks left. We just are fresh off of the WPIL soccer playoff pairing show here on the MSA Sports Network. So I was going to say while the temperatures start to, to chill, you start to get the little football fever, but the temperatures haven't really chilled yet. They've gone the other way, haven't they? Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We're in for enough chilling over the next Correct. five, six months. Correct. So the longer we can put it off, the better. But um, good stuff. Uh, I, I, the uh, the playoff races are starting to take shape. Um, you know, we talked about the expansion to four classifications in volleyball and soccer, and it seemed like a nice fit. Different here. This It is different. And, you know, again, I think you need to hold off and wait to see how it happens through the postseason. But um, uh, a lot going on and uh, maybe too much going on. <laughs> 7, 11, 16, 25, 33, and we got five. No, no one in this one. I was just counting up the teams who already had uh, their tickets punched to the Howard Hines and the Road RMU. That's right. It's sort of a split. You know, all that construction that's been going on out near the airport, now we know why, because they are splitting the highway to Hines to off and the, the schools in 2A and 1A will veer right. That's correct. They'll go right. To the uh, Road to RMU. Saturday, by the way, confirmed uh, those championships will be Saturday. Yeah. Knew that before, but I guess they officially announced it, uh, the Board of Control voting on that, uh, the Saturday after Thanksgiving for the 2A and 1A championships, the Friday before Thanksgiving for the 6A, 5A, 4A, and 3A title games. And a coach who hopes to be part of the fun at Heinz Field Joins us now, we welcome in Greg Perry, the head coach of the Keystone Oaks Golden Eagles. Coach Perry, how are you? I'm good, Don. How are you tonight? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, lots to talk about uh, with you and the great start of the Keystone Oaks Golden Eagles, but you know, just sort of feeding off what we were just talking about, try to get, you know, in this season of change, the various coaches, what the, how they feel things are going, and this has been a, a very dramatically different season for uh, for you guys, uh, you in particular, your staff, and the coach and the and the Golden Eagles with you know part of the Allegheny Conference in in three A and all the you know the talk before the season how three A is getting the short end of the stick and 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 now you're dealing with new opponents and teams you're not familiar with in a in a very competitive conference. At least through seven weeks, which what's your total take? Well, 
going into it, Don, we didn't know what to expect with the new classifications. Um, I know myself and a couple other coaches that I had talked to were a little bit concerned about losing that top four teams making the playoffs. I know that last particular school and have a chance, you know, everybody needs a chance. We knew we're going to Alabama. that it was a swim. I think that gave our kids in the off season something to strive for because they finally got a taste of, of what it's like to play. You know, we played Al Cooper Tough, we unfortunately lost lost the game, but the experience of growing up in this area and never being a part of the highway to Hines or the Three Rivers, you know, championships, I think that everybody needs to understand that that's a great environment. It's a great learning experience for everybody. So when we found out only the top two were going to go, you know, we really had our backs against the wall and figured that we really can't afford to fizzle coming out of the gate because you open up week one with a conference opponent. That's why we chose not to play a week zero game because I couldn't afford to get anybody hurt in that week zero game. And you know, every time the lights come on, you try to win. So we opted for uh, a scrimmage knowing that we opened up week one against Valley, a conference opponent, and we knew we had to win that because you couldn't stumble. You know, if they were taking four teams out of your conference, you have a chance you can stumble a little bit, still rebound and get in. And once you get in, everybody has a shot. So we looked at it like week one was our playoff game. We had to win week one. So we geared our summer our, I'm sorry, our winter and summer workouts towards that week one opponent. And the other thing that we had going against us was we we're very unfamiliar with everything up through 28. Right. Um, we, you know, from my stint across the street 20 years at Seton LaSalle, we had played the teams around here in the South Hills, uh, ventured down into Washington County, but we never really ventured up 28. So that was a whole new ball game for us. Um, you know, we're excited about it. We knew it was going to be a little bit more travel, but we had no idea much about any of these teams. So, you know, we we got some homework done on them, and and we just prepared our kids and say, look, we're going to take care of what Keystone Oaks has to do, and we'll worry about what happens down the road when it it comes to us. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, we lost some rivalries with some good football teams, but, you know, now we're going up and meeting new friends and, and opponents and, it, it, it's been a good year. You know, it's a lot of travel on a school bus, but you got to play the hand you're dealt with, and we've accepted it, and our kids have bought into what we're trying to do over here. And, um, you know, we've had some success this year. You know, it's unfortunate, the whole situation with 3A and the way it was set up, and I know that the, there were coaches that were trying to get it changed once the WPIO announced that it would be – only eight teams, and, mm-hmm. and and they would be part of Heinz Field, and then the eventual champion would still have a week off. Right. And, and, and the coaches tried to change that. I understand from the WPIL standpoint as well, you mm-hmm. need four games to justify renting Heinz sure. Field. Uh, but we had uh, Jeff Belts from Beaver on here a, a few weeks ago, and he, he had an idea, uh, and, and I thought uh, – Pretty good. Why not allow the the this classification a chance zero to play it? You know, one of them teams is going to be out. It's a very strong football conference, but after the next cycle, you know. I don't know that anybody can make any changes going into the 017 year, and we don't know what's coming down the road in 018. Mm-hmm. I think that Coach Belts had a great idea, and it's something that I would probably be for once I looked into a little more. 
You know, I just think it's about opportunities for kids. Yeah, does the 16 ever beat the one? No. Does the you know does, does the 15 beat the two? Not, you know, not enough times to even make it warranted. Right. But sometimes it's about the experience. You know, you get one chance to play high school sports. You got four years, and I think that we have to do what we can in this generation, particularly, to get kids to participate. You know, I think you have to give them something to strive for because our numbers are down across the region and, and not only just football, but in a lot of the sports. So, and, and, and Greg, you made a good point, and this was the point I always, you know, Mike White and I always debated. He always thought there were too many teams in the old format and, mm-hmm. and a lot of bad teams would make the playoffs. And I, and I, mm-hmm. always, I always took the opposite view that, hey, e- even if they're, you know, three and six – you know, they get another week of practice. They get another playoff game. They could tell their kids, hey, I played in the WPL playoffs, sure. even if it was one and out. But you made a good point in that, you know, for some younger teams, that extra week of practice and that playoff uh, participation, even if it is one and out, can be, an, you know, can jump jump you it can forward. Be a sounding yeah. forward to the next season. Right. You know, so it's – it, it, you know, everybody's good. Whoever has to talk last is going to have an opportunity to get their speak in. You know, I don't know what's right or wrong with it. You know, we're going to deal with what we're dealt with. They're taking the top two teams, and hopefully we can finish out and be one of them teams. But I understand what Mike's point of it is. You know, there's a lot of wasted games, but look at the wild card in the NFL. How many times does that team get to make it through to the Super Bowl? Yeah. You know, they added the wild card for what? And naturally money. But it gives teams an opportunity in the NFL a chance to make some money. But sometimes that team runs the table and makes it through. Unfortunately, in high school, it doesn't happen that much. But it's, you know, we got to see what we're doing. Are we in this for the kids? Yep. Are we in this for monetary value? What are we in this for? You know, I think the bottom line is all of us as coaches want to give our kids a chance to experience this thing. And, yeah, you know, yeah, we're not going to beat the number one seed if we're the 16th seed. But, you know what? We had a great week of practice. We got some student body involved in it. Yep. And we kind of built up it for the next year. So I don't think it was wrong that we got invited last year, and I don't know that it's it's right the way they're doing it now either. But like I said before, we're dealt this hand, and, and we're going to play it. I know when this went down, I caught, talked to some coaches, Coach Samantha at uh, Aliquippa, and, you know, he, he was kind of in agreement with me that, hey, this is about kids having an opportunity here. You know, so I, I don't know which way it's going to go in another cycle, but only the people that sit down up in that office will figure that out. And we got to play with whatever they give us. Yeah. Six and one for the season, five and oh, Keystone Oaks in good shape to get, as Coach Perry mentioned, one of those top two spots, uh, although two big ones with Freeport and Seton LaSalle. Uh, two teams that are in the mix as well coming up. I, I don't want to – it's been such a successful season, and Bobby and Mark are going to jump in and, and, and ask you about it. I don't mm-hmm. want to zero in on, on the one blemish, but it was such a magical night at Dormont Stadium. I know the immediacy, you guys came up on the short end of the stick of that 77-49 mm-hmm. loss to Beaver. So the immediacy, I'm sure, was disappointment. But now that you were a few weeks away, have you had a chance to, to think about – you know, again, just the big picture and how how special of a night that truly was? Well, it it was a very special night for us. You know, it was a great football game. Um, You know, we we had the lead going into the the third quarter there, and we just kind of ran out of gas. You know, because it was such a the, the way the game was played. Oh, it was it was like, was like Hagler Hearns. You guys were yeah. both coming out throwing haymakers. You know, we had a couple kids that were out that game, and now we get a couple kids back, so that gives us a little more depth. Um, you know, was, we just we just ran out of gas, and and they took advantage of it late in the game. And um, you know, it was a game that I have never been around to see two individuals, one on my side and one on the other side, put up that kind of yardage. It just seemed like whatever one of them two was going to get tired first was the way this thing was going to go down. And unfortunately, Alex's weapons kind of tired out on him, and Darius's legs never gave out. So, you know, it was a, it was a very exciting game, and I think it's something our kids will never forget. But um, it was a very good, it was a very fun night. I'll say yeah. that we came up on the end of it. But you know what, our kids saw again that they can compete. 
Right. You know, we played three quarters head to head with at that time the number one team in, in in three in the WPL. So we got a little bit of confidence from it. You know, you, you, there's an old saying: you don't you don't learn much from winning, but you learn something from losing. So I hope we gained something out of that night. And they're number one again now after yes. the, uh, the with yes. Central Valley losing. Uh, you have. Uh, earned a reputation as a quarterback's guru. You worked with some great quarterbacks in your tenure, your previous tenure at Seton LaSalle, going back to the, you know Bruce Gradkowski and, and all the great quarterbacks uh, that wore the green and gold. And you even worked uh, in the offseason with the Brumbaws uh, at, mm-hmm. at South Fayette. Now you have a, a tremendous one in, in the black and gold with, with Alex Smith. How does he – rate uh as far as some of the great quarterbacks you have and 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 unlike some of the great quarterbacks you've had he can not only do damage with that right arm but he can also burn you with his legs i think that that's the big difference between alex and you know billy stall bruce Gerkowski, anthony doria you know we we didn't allow them to run too much bruce probably could have got away with it because he was such a great athlete but Alex takes advantage of his feet. You know, he could he could have a chance to be a 2,000-yard pass or a 1,000-yard rusher this year for us. But he's just that kind of athlete. He understands when the play breaks down that he can get out and move. And, you know, he's 6'4", 195 pounds, but he doesn't run back. I mean, he is, you know, when you watch him run, you're thinking, man, he doesn't look like he's moving that fast. But he's out running some kids. Uh, he has trust in his receivers, and he knows that when it breaks down, he's able to use his legs to get us out of trouble. You know, we see we're seeing a lot of man coverage. You know, so you know what happens in man coverage is you don't account for the quarterback because your back's turned while you're running down the field. So we're taking advantage of some of that kind of stuff with Alex, and um, you know, he's a big prototype kid. He's a little bit bigger than Billy Stahl was. Same kind of arm. You know, he he runs. He's athletic, kind of like Bruce a little bit. You know, um, you know, we're happy to have him, and he's learning. It's only his second year playing and, and starting. So, you know, we just completed our 18th start with him, and he has 4,000 career yards in the air now. So um, he's understanding, and, and he's playing well, and our kids really look up to him, and he's a great leader for us. This week in the WPIAL here on the MSA Sports Network, we're getting you ready for week eight of the high school football season, visiting with Greg Perry, the head coach of the Keystone Oaks Golden Eagles. Don Rebel, Mark Schaas, here is Bob Orquist. Coach, thanks for joining us. I was excited to find out when Don sent the email that the quarterback whisperer would be on uh, the show tonight. (laughs) Thank you. Because uh, Lanny and I will have the coverage of your game. I want to Mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about Alex. Uh, Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys are uh, a spread, read option type of offense? Um, We're more of a spread... Uh, zone read offense, yeah. So zone read. So yeah. what is the key read? Like a, in a regular option, you read the tackles. And that right. kind of offense, what is a key read uh, for Alex in this case? We're, we're, we're going to read the defensive end to see what he does, whether Alex keeps the ball, whether he hands it off. Uh, first things first, we, we, try to, we try to throw the football. Um, uh, we're starting a game. We want to throw the football. We want to try to open up the defense and then try to get into our run game. So we're going four wide receivers, and we got five wide receivers in there predominantly also. And, you know, we're trying to open that up so now we can open up our quarterback run game by spreading the defense out. You know, my theory is that the less guys in that box, the better off we are. So that's what we try to do. We try to spread you out and look the pass and open the run with the pass. You've got uh, a lot of weapons. We uh, well know Alex, uh, his job, Devin Thomas uh, as well, but uh, Nick Ribnack, uh, as far as receiver, Joey Tortorella, uh, also Dylan Knorr, uh, a lot of uh, weapons there. And then uh, Kieran Poe comes your way. Yes. Uh, how do you fit that all in? Uh, uh, were you going five wides before Poe arrived, or did he make it a five wide type of situation for you guys? We've been going four or five wide all year long. We weren't sure if we were going to get Q back. You know, he, he moved into our district, and, and it was a fight between the WPO, and then we, we won two weeks ago. Um, we we talk to the kids all the time, look, we're going to throw the ball 35, sometimes more than that a game. You're going to get yours, okay? But we have to be team players about it. We're not going to be selfish. You know, this game you might get seven targets, but next game you might get ten. 
You know, this game you might get two, but next game you might get eight. So as long as we're putting a slash in the W column, we need them guys to all be team players and understand that they're going to get their chances. And, you know, the way our offense is set up, everybody's going to get a chance. We just don't hone in on one guy. And the kids have bought into it. Uh, Chu gives us another deep threat with Dylan Noor. They're probably two of the fastest kids that I've ever had in the 25 years that I've been involved in high school football. And Nick is just a solid, you know, I call him Howard Twilley, but they don't remember who he was. He was just that slow white receiver that caught the ball every time he threw it to him. You know, so uh, we have some weapons to get deep, and we have Nick on some underneath stuff. So right now, you know, we're, we're doing okay with it. You know, we ran into some rain the other night against Burl. You know, we ran the ball a little more than we probably would have wanted to, but we can't let the elements uh, take care of us because we know that if we get into this playoff run, we've been there before. We know what the weather could be like. I'm uh, not ashamed of it. I'm old enough to remember Howard Twilley, so <laughs> I like the reference. Yes. <laughs> um, was it a tough sell for the kids? One football, five wide receivers, or was it easy? It's, I, I like to contrast it or compare it to trying to get – uh, basketball players to focus on defense. Was it a tough right. sell for you guys? Well, well, here's the way I look at things. It, it, you know, in our offense, we run a three-step spread offense. We're the West Coast offense. So my theory is if I have a pro-style offense, I'm going to hand it to the tailback 45 times a game. The tailback's the only one touching the ball the whole game. And what we try to do is get everybody a hand in it, you know. My thinking is if I throw a five-yard hitch or a five-yard slant, that's as good to me as running a power. So we're going to spread it around. We're not dependent on one guy. This game of football at 3A level, we don't have a great ton of depth. So if you lose a guy for a game or two like we've had, there's still enough weapons in there that understand what you're trying to do. If I'm a pro-style offense, my tailback gets nicked up. You know, I understand the boy down in Mapleton. He has a bad ankle, ran the ball three times last last week. That's going to hurt that team because he's a predominantly one-man team. But – we try to get these guys just to buy in that this is a team game and everybody's going to get a shot. When you get your shot, take advantage of it. Let's talk about your opponent. Uh, Freeport comes your way on Friday night. A little bit of a different offense, uh, a more uh, of a running team. They run a lot of jet mm-hmm. sweeps. What kind of challenges uh, will that present for your defense? Well, the, the first thing that I'm, I'm glad of is we're not driving up to Freeport. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we made that trip last week to Apollo. It took us about an hour and 35 minutes, so now they have to come down here and, and ride that school bus. So we understand what we're getting into. They're a top football team. They like to run the ball. The quarterback is a very good athlete. They try to get him into the uh, into the mix to, you know, he's a run-pass type of guy. I think he likes to run the ball a little more than pass. Very quick. And, um, you know, they're running quarterback counters. They're running quarterback options with him. But uh, they have a nice group of kids, and they try to put a lot of pressure on you offense, on defensively. So we have our work cut out for us, but, you know, we're getting healthy. We feel good about where our kids are right now. And, you know, one thing I've always told my kids is worry about what you do and don't worry about what they do. So we're going to prepare ourselves to play Freeport. We know it's going to be a physical football game. They're tough kids. Um, We've watched film of them. They played Seat LaSalle very tough. They had a bad game against Apollo Ridge, but, you know, Dwayne Brown tends to do that to you. So. (laughs) We'll be prepared, and, uh, and hopefully it's a good night. Uh, right now it's looking like a little wet, but we're hoping that the weather clears out. We're talking with Greg Perry. He's the head coach of the Keystone Oaks Golden Eagles. Friday night, a chance for Keystone Oaks to clinch their first conference title since 2008 right here on the network. Don Rebel is aboard. Bob Workwis and Mark Shoss alongside as well. Coach, you were talking with Don and Bob earlier about uh... – you know, you use five wide receivers, you like to throw the football, but you use the pass to set up the run. And I think some teams, when they get into the, the, the spread, that they don't want to run the football. And I like the mm-hmm. fact that you are you you can have success doing that because if you're able to build a lead, hey, you're able to milk that clock too. Yes. Um, and, and we do that. We, we're able to run. You know, we, we have run game opportunities for us once we do get the lead you know we're not going to be the type of guy that wants to throw the ball when you're up 40 points but you know that's the nature of our offense this is the offense we run 
You know, I brought it with me from Seat LaSalle. You know, I think when we played out of Clifford in 2004 at Heinz Field, we threw the ball 18 straight times. You know, so our kids love the idea that we're, we're not afraid to take a chance. But we also have, you know, Devin Thomas is a heck of a running back. And when we have to, we feel that we're confident enough to be able to grind it out a little bit also. Plus, if you get into a game in the playoffs, when you get some sloppy weather, that that does help you out a little bit. Talk a little bit about well, this turf helps uh, helps immensely in, in 2016. <laughs> most of these games we played on turf. I could not imagine the Burl two weeks ago playing that game on grass because you know I watched the highlights of the Alaquipa Clareton game and yeah we might have had a little bit of a different offense going that evening. Talk to me a little bit about the offensive line too because without the guys up front you're not going to give Alex the time to throw the football. You know, we're, we're led by two seniors, Tim Mazzarini and Christian Freak. They're both senior starters. Um, that Tim makes the calls for us up front. We're, we're, we're a, a man on blocking system, and they're giving us enough time, you know, and they understand it. We work a lot starting in the spring on our pass protections because that's our goal is to throw the football. And like you said, if we don't have the time to throw the football, we're going to be in trouble. So, We've always worked hard on our pass protections and picking up our hot routes with our receivers. And Alex understands that he communicates well with the linemen. You know, Tim's his best friend. They hang out a lot. So, you know, whatever Alex gets, they understand that they're getting too. So, you know, it's worked out so far good for us. And the other thing, too, your defense has done a very nice job this season. Obviously, with the quick pace to your your offense – it's going to put some pressure on the defense, too. Uh, they've done a nice job throughout for, for you this year. You know, I, I hear a lot from our defensive staff that, you know, you got to slow it down a little bit. We were, you know, we're a no-huddle, fast, try-to-play-fast team. And, you know, I hear the guys saying, hey, can you guys slow it down a little bit and get like a 12-play drive to keep the defense off the field? But that's what happened in the Beaver game. You know, they score, we score, we score. We, we just needed to – Maybe slow it down again if we play them again to maybe not go so fast to give them defensive guys a chance because, trust me, all my wideouts, you're going to see them on the other side of the ball also. So, you know, we stress to them that defense is very important because, you know, if you don't score more than them, you're not going to win a football game. But uh, no offense, in the last uh, three-plus years, uh, a lot of – People have had that problem with Darius Wise over the years. Yes, I bet they have. <laughs> talk, talk to me a little bit about, you know, every, everybody keeps talking about the, the Beaver Valley, and, and with good reason. There There's very good football teams in there. Mm-hmm. There's pretty good teams in your conference, too. Yes, I, I believe we have some good teams in our conference. I've I've had the pleasure, or maybe it's the mispleasure, of, of playing Aliquippa for years and years and years. I mean, it's a great rivalry that I had with them. Um, you you just you know to get to be able to go to the pit to play a football game or something that's it's priceless you know and we played Beaver when I was at Seton LaSalle and you know when you're going in to play them teams it's going to be a hard fought matchup and we kind of found that out going up to Deer Lakes and Apollo Ridge that you know they're tough kids up there also and uh, you know we, we've been fortunate enough this year to come out on top of most of these games. And I don't know what's going to happen in the next two weeks, but, you know, we have to take care of business. I know Freeport's going to be one of the tougher teams we played. So we're excited. We're going to be up for the challenge, and hopefully our kids are ready to play. Close out the season with a pair at Dormont Stadium, including Friday's game, Lanny and Bobby with the call, Freeport and Keystone Oaks. And I know that's your focus, and we're a few years removed from you moving across the street uh, Greg, but I want to go back to the the last two years, especially two years ago, uh, playing Seton LaSalle in, in the old Century Conference. What was that like the first time as head coach of Keystone Oaks after so many years on the it opposing was, sideline? It, it was a little bit of a difference. I, you know, I had I had coached most of them kids. You know, in you know, change isn't good for kids. Sometimes they don't accept it or understand why you left or what opportunity you had to leave. And I talked to some of the linemen before the game and expressed my gratitude of how well they were playing. And, you know, you're on a, you're on a new team, you got new colors, and you got to coach that team up. But, you know, if you spend 20 years in a place, 
I still had friends on that staff over there. And it was just a different feeling. Last year was a little bit easier feeling. You know, unfortunately, we didn't get to win in either game. But, you know, you spend 20 years over there and you get uh, these players that you meet. And, and, you know, I coached some of them kids for three years and I left their senior year, you know, particularly the quarterback that I'd worked out for five years, Tyler Perrone. I started working him out when he was in eighth grade. You know, it's just you build relationships. And, and to Tyler's credit, you know, in the summertime, I have workouts on Sunday mornings that I invite all the uh, WPL kids. I get about 10, 12 kids from different schools. Tyler's at Waysburg now, and Tyler shows up every Sunday. Mm. So that makes me feel good that I at least did something right. And me and Tyler have a relationship. He understands now why I had to leave. But, you know, it's one of them things you have to get over because you got a new group of kids that are looking at you with their mouth open and they want coached up. Damon gone, now Rob Carter takes over. He took over late, and I think he's done a, a pretty nice job with that uh, with that St. LaSalle team, all things considered. Rob has been one of my best friends. I coached Rob when I was at St. LaSalle. Rob was under me when I was the offensive coordinator there. He was my wide receiver coach. And when I became head coach, Rob was kind of my quasi-moto offensive coordinator. So I've known Rob since Rob was 15 years old. I talk to Rob frequently. Rob's doing a fantastic job. He was thrown into a situation late. He's done a good job. He's getting his kids prepared to play. And I think that if he gets a chance to run this through, he's going to be a much better football coach once he gets his handprint all over this program. Mm. Greg, job well done uh, through seven weeks. I know you want to be playing a lot more uh, into the postseason and beyond uh, with this very talented and explosive Keystone Oaks team. Congratulations uh, on the good job thus far and uh, nothing but the best. Thanks, Don. Appreciate what you guys do for high school football, getting the word out there. And we're going to try. We're going to keep working at it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Don. Thanks, All Coach. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Greg Perry, the uh, head coach of the Keystone Oaks School and Eagles, did a great job in his tenure at Seton LaSalle. Um, and, and the thing that uh, he just sort of mentioned there, he, he and Bobby uh, had a good line about being the quarterback whisperer. I mean, he has earned that reputation that uh, I know he caught a lot of flack when, when the Brumbaws, the, at least the two that didn't come to Seton LaSalle, uh, when he was working with them in the off season, but he said, you know, it, it's more the about it, it, it's it's about helping kids whether they go to your school that you coach at or not. If you can help a kid get better and maybe even earn some sort of uh, financial help at the next level, that's what it's all about. And uh, and you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of quarterbacks have seeked out his advice and have, have been better off for it. And coach Perry made uh, that comment, a similar comment earlier about, you know, the, you have four years to play high school sports, yeah. whatever it is. So it, it's the same way. And, uh, you know, it's about it's, unfortunately we get too stuck on wins and losses yeah. and it's about developing young people. And I, I think that's get, that gets lost sometimes. And, and I would agree, I wholeheartedly agree with that. You know, it's all about the the entire development and the entire experience of the kid. And if you as a coach can help a kid along the way, yep. and we know other coaches throughout the WPL and all the sports that are the same way, and they will find a way to either help them out or help them uh, to try and get in the next level. All right, uh, we're going to sort of change things up here a little bit. When we return, we're going to start looking at some of the big games coming up. Uh, We'll talk to our next guest, Joe Lomenza, at the top of the hour. It's this week in the WPIL on the MSA Sports Network. When looking to replace your athletic field, choose ProGrass first in turf. ProGrass has installed over 500 fields in the U.S. Getting the best artificial turf for your field depends on both the product and the partner you choose. That's why architects, athletic directors, and players choose the ProGrass Performance System. ProGrass maintains an active presence in the synthetic turf industry as members of the Sports Turf Management Association and the American Sports Builder Association and is proud to be recognized as the FIFA Preferred Manufacturer. Call ProGrass today, 866 866- 
6207060603 or visit them on the web at www.prograsturf.com. Prograss, first in turf. The team at UPMC Sports Medicine doesn't just rebuild wrists and knees. They build better athletes. Athletes at every level who want to get stronger and faster and prevent injuries. Fact is, no other sports medicine program in the region is more experienced when it comes to treating, training, and inspiring athletes. UPMC, the official health care provider of the Penguins, Steelers, and you. Find out more at upmcsportsmedicine.com. Right now, when you refer a friend to open a new personal or business checking account at First Commonwealth Bank, you can earn a generous cash reward. It doesn't even have to be a friend. Could be a relative. Could be a Bruins fan. Could be that guy over there with the weird hair thing going on. It doesn't matter. Refer anyone to open an account and it will really pay off for you. They'll even get a cash reward themselves, no matter who they root for. First Commonwealth Bank, member FDIC. Learn more at a local branch or visit fcbanking.com. People ask what drives me. It's the respect I have for my opponents, the trust I have in my teammates, a coach who treats me with dignity, and a university that has faith in me on and off the field. That's what keeps me focused, why I practice harder, play my heart out. I play to win. I play for Carlo. Tell us your story using hashtag what drives you. Carlo University, a proud sponsor of the MSA Sports Network. Be sure to follow the MSA Sports Network on social media this season for the most up-to-date scores, pictures, videos, breaking news, and links to our articles. You can find the MSA Sports Network on Twitter and Instagram under the handle MSA Sports and at Facebook.com slash MSA Sports. The MSA Sports Network is also on YouTube under the handle MSA Sports WPIAL where you can watch hundreds of interviews with local student athletes, full games, highlights, and more. Whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or our websites, MSA Sports is the place to go for high school sports in Western Pennsylvania. For the most complete recap of Friday night's WPIAL football action, tune in on your way home from the game to the MSA Sports Scoreboard Show here on the MSA Sports Network. Hi, I'm Don Rebel. Join me in the MSA Sports Gang for all the scores and recaps from the top games, plus the MSA Sports Roundtable. That's the MSA Sports Scoreboard Show after the game on Friday nights on the MSA Sports Network and at msasports.net. UPMC Sports Medicine is excited to partner with MSA Sports in the inaugural year of Stay Strong and Play On program. Student athletes will be recognized to remain dedicated to their teams and are determined to return to play while recovering from an injury. UPMC will be granting two $1,000 scholarships at the end of the year to athletes who have managed to stay strong and play on. Dwayne Brown of Apollo Ridge was our September winner, our October winner. We'll be interviewed on a center stage within the next couple of weeks at msasports.net. And speaking of winners, ProGrass, our boys and girls soccer and football players of the month. The ballot will be out next week for our October players of the month. With a veteran crew, Mark Schoss and Bob Orquist, I'm Don Rebel. This week in the WPIL continues. Usually we'd be talking to guest number two. Joe Lomenzo Blackhawk will be joining us at the top of the hour. So we'll start breaking down the week eight WPIO football schedule. In the uh, Class 6A, seven of the eight teams have been determined. And the one team can be sewn up with a victory by Seneca Valley as they host Shaler. That's windless Shaler. So good chance for the Raiders to wrap up a playoff berth. Pine Richland visits Butler. Those are the two Northern Seven Conference games in 6A. Southeastern Conference, everybody excited about a showdown next week for the conference title, Bethel Park, Mount Lebanon. Bethel Park has a conference game as a tune-up, home to Altoona. Canna McMillan visits Peters Township in the other conference game. Non-conference, mention Mount Lebanon, a uh, good challenge as they host Penn Hills. Penn Hill's alive for now, but if Shaler loses to Seneca Valley, Indians out. Top-ranked Pittsburgh Central Catholic, everybody's favorite in that classification, hosting the Norwin Knights. North Allegheny visits Hempfield. Class 5A, big battle in the Allegheny 9 Conference. The final three weeks determining 
or I should say three of the final four weeks determining who will win this conference title. Two weeks ago, Bobby, you had a chance to see West Allegheny pummel Upper St. Clair. Indians can clinch the conference title on the road at Woodland Hills, a Woodland Hills team that suddenly is struggling a little bit, really had their hands full last week in a victory over Moon, struggled as well two weeks ago against North Hills. Maybe a trap game uh, against Moon, 31-27 to win. Uh, the Wolverines uh, got a big play. Daniel Jones hit Avram Abramowitz on a 93-yard touchdown pass. They come from behind, although uh, you're looking at a trap game West Allegheny could have had the same thing because they were playing Hampton, who's at the bottom of the conference. No such issues for West Allegheny, 38-3. Uh, they took care of business. Their defense is just outstanding. They just chase the football around the field. Uh, they've got some great contributions from Nick Ross, uh, at quarterback with over 1,000 yards passing on the season. Kenny White, 11 uh, or more touchdowns leading uh, the rushing attack, but uh, I've seen them twice, and they struggled a little bit with North Hills, with who isn't that bad of a team. They're a playoff qualifier uh, earlier in the season. Um, but their defense, uh, especially with that performance against Upper St. Clair, Mark made a, uh, a believer out of me. And a lot of times we talk about coaches deserving, sometimes maybe undeserving. You can't look at this matchup without mentioning the following. Bob Pelko, seven WPIL titles, George Novak with six. Absolutely. Two of the best coaches uh, in the history of the WPL squaring off. You talked a little bit about Nick Ross. What I like about him is his efficiency. It's 60, uh, 64% completion percentage on the season. And, and then Kenny White with his uh, his touchdown proudness. Uh <laughs> Yeah, and you can a sparkling in a sparkling orange or red shoes from the Landy for Terry Center stage interview. <laughs> but but you kick to him and he just returns the opening kickoff ninety eight yards for a touchdown. And then if you're able to stop him, if you're able to stop West Allegheny, you got DJ upset that he's got eight field goals on the year. So they're capable of scoring on every possession. And that's what I like about West Day. For Woodland Hills though. They do have a variety of weapons, but really, I don't know if we've seen everything that Woodland Hills can do offensively so far this season. So, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting. Plus, you know, looking at the stats, defense allowing just 15 points a game. Uh, I'm going to wager there's probably going to be a few more points than 15 in uh four scored in this game. Yeah, just four point seven a lot of game done for West Allegheny. And, and and Woodland Hills they 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 lack they've always always had that one guy that is really at least one guy that has carried the load sometimes, you know, in, in the terms of their running backs in recent years, two guys that doesn't seem to have materialized through the first seven weeks. You well, know what I'm saying? Have, that one yes, they, guy. Correct. And you knew um, you know, you had uh, players playing from their freshman season. Jawan Hill is over 600 yards. Saeed Holt, who was uh, the next guy to step up, is uh, at about 450. Both do have double-digit touchdowns, but it was interesting with the power and speed in, in years past in, in the backfield, and uh, nobody stepped up. Plus, the passing game has, uh, e- even though they've got the, the big touchdown pass to defeat Moon, mm-hmm. the passing game has been inconsistent. They haven't needed the passing game in years past. And, and they're going to need it prob- like on Friday night against West Allegheny. I, I think there's no question of that. I mentioned DJ Epsatnik, uh, three field goals in 2013 as a freshman, and then he scored 10 points as a sophomore a couple years ago, including the winning extra point. These two teams, even though they're, they were quad A, triple A in past seasons, this will be the third straight year they, they'll play each other. Last year at Woodland Hills, the Wolverines won 22 to 15. Two years ago at West Allegheny, had a chance uh, to call that game 42 41 overtime thriller. Went the, the way of the Indians. West Allegheny, Woodland Hills, Friday night on? The network. The network. The winner, by the way, is uh, the outright conference champion. Conference champion. That is correct. And if Woodland Hills loses at home, they'll play Upper St. Clair for second place in week nine. Speaking of the Panthers trying to snap a two game losing streak. Good chance they will do so at Windless Hampton. Moon visits Baldwin, Chartiers Valley at Fox Chapel. The Foxes have won three in a row. 
all four playoff teams have been determined in the Allegheny Nine with West Allegheny, Woodland Hills, Upper St. Clair, North Hills all in. Nobody has clinched in Class 5A's Big East Conference. Two games separate six teams. The marquee matchup, a pair, two of the three teams tied for first place, the Gateway Gators and the McKeesport Tigers. It seems like the old days of the Quad South with those two teams hooking up late in the season with a lot at stake. 6-2 and two Gateway, 6-1 and one McKeesport. You have a Gateway team that has won four straight games after losses to Woodland Hills and, and Armstrong. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a Gateway team. You know, Dylan Urban has uh, scored eight, teams, eight times so far this year. Two in the win over Kiske, 22-13. And then you got Brisker with eight touchdowns. Uh, Gateway, to me, it, it seems like the Gators are definitely back as far as... The, but that said, one game could change the whole face with those six teams being in playoff contention. Only four are making the playoffs. You got Don Hall and uh, Matt Miller going at it, too. A couple of uh, uh, first-year head coaches. Interesting, because I'm preparing for the games that we're going to talk about, and it seems like everyone is a dual-threat quarterback nowadays. We just talked yeah. to Coach Perry, and uh, you know, Alex Smith can run and throw. Uh, so I'm going down, and here's a dual threat. Here's a dual threat. And then normally you have a quarterback who is not a dual threat because he throws the football. We have a quarterback in this game is not a dual threat because he runs the football, and it's Javon Shears who's the leading rusher for McKeesport. I know shocking, Shock, yeah. shocking stuff coming out from McKeesport as far as that goes. Holy but Cecil he Howard. He leads them in TDs, but they, you know, that's the same offense, and it's just so different that it's hard to stop. But it's a gateway team who is used to it because over the past years, and you mentioned, it's uh, been uh, the quad south, and it's been these two teams. Uh, but McKeesport has, in addition to, Sh- to Shears, Six runners with over 100 yards. Devon Brown, Carlos, or Carlinos, AC, J.J. Harper, Breon Green, Leighton Jordan. And Jordan is the leading rusher as far as average-wise on the season for the McKeesport uh, Tigers. Four players scored touchdowns in their win over Upper St. Clair uh, last week. Javon Shears had a rushing touchdown, stopped the press. It's smart. He also had a passing touchdown for uh, the mm-hmm. uh, McLe- McKeesport Tigers in the win over Upper St. Clair. Two straight losses uh, for the Panthers, by the way, in that one. But uh, definitely a good matchup. Definitely two teams that uh, know each other. So the rivalry remains, even though it moved up into 5A. And what I like, too, is McKeesport, after that tough loss to Armstrong way back when, that you know they've done what they've had to do, winning five, five in a row. They yeah, set yeah. up this big matchup. You know, Winner is in. Uh, and the loser could also eventually uh, clinch, although they may have to wait a week to do so. Armstrong, the other team tied with them for first place. The long trek from Armstrong County to Fayette County, they take on the Connellsville Falcons. Latrobe is at Plum, two teams that will not be part of the postseason talk. And Penn Trafford, a Kiskey area, final game at historic Davis Field in Vandergrift. And also, really, the final chance for both of these teams who have been reeling since the midway point of the regular season loser this game, likely home for the playoffs. The 5A non-conference game, two teams likely that will be playoff bound, the North Hills Indians visiting the Franklin Regional Panthers. Greg Bottas' team has done a great job turning things around after a slow start. All right, let's go to 4A now. In the Big Nine Conference, what a whooping Thomas Jefferson put on Bell Vernon last week. Bobby O saw it. Witness. TJ home to Laurel Highlands, where it could get even uglier. Greensburg Salem <laughs> is at Trinity. Albert Gallatin trying to snap a 31 game losing streak, taking on Uniontown. The Red Raiders posting their first victory of the year last week against rival Laurel Highlands. And West Mifflin against Bell Vernon. Um, Last year, these two teams met. I believe they were both undefeated when they met, the Titans and the Leopards. Now, even though West Mifflin still has a game with Thomas Jefferson, realistically, you start looking at this one as a battle for second place in a home playoff game uh, on the gold turf at Bell Vernon. Yeah, chance to rebound. Well, Bell Vernon had uh, a six-game winning streak snapped uh, against TJ. Chance to rebound for both. 
Not true. West Mifflin, uh, not as uh, bad, right, but right. just a, di- a different, uh, uh, maybe even more demoralizing <laughs> loss. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. I want to mention this. It was unbelievable how good Devin Danielson was and how good he is. He's uh, one of three players for TJ to start since his freshman year. The other two, uh, Reed and Nix, both made it to the NFL, but they couldn't block him. They had three players trying to block him, Bill Chirpak, the understatement of the year, they can't block him. Nobody can. It was interesting. because You know, it's funny because Mike White sat in that exact chair the other day and said the exact same thing. He was so impressed with them. It was Danielson. incredible. And then, so you're focusing three players on Danielson, but then Jimbo Nasida and Logan Burnsworth and Noah Palmer just destroyed Belvern in 14 plays that lost yardage. Uh, head coach Matt Humbert said, we were going to come in and try to make him throw the ball to beat us, and TJ did that. But it was interesting because... I talked to a friend of mine whose uh, son is the center for Ringgold, and I asked him, did, did, your, did your son have to try to block Devin, Devin Daniels? And he said, yeah, he tried. <laughs> so well, you don't have to feel that bad, West Mifflin. Bell Vernon, maybe, uh, because speaking of Ringgold, uh, Ringgold scored two times in the final eight seconds. Uh, a lot of uh, penalties. There were a couple personal fouls against West Mifflin. Uh, that led them to score. There was another personal foul, so they went for the onside kick. Short field, George Martin threw for 329 yards. The other bad news for West Mifflin is Howie Reed, who was the leading rusher, uh, one of the leading rushers in the WPL, fractured his right tibia. So he's out of commission now for uh, West Mifflin. They're 5-1 in the conference. Bell Vernon is 6-1. Both of these teams suffered their first loss of the season. It's been interesting how it always, uh, back in AAA, would come down to the final games uh, of uh, the season, Mark, and it was TJ and West Mifflin, which is, again, the final game. But this is a big one and a chance to rebound for Bell Vernon. Absolutely. Bell Vernon's got to show something because, you know, after you were humiliated last week by TJ, and then then you have West Mifflin, on the other hand, who lost in, as you said, truly heartbreaking fashion. You can't commit those kind of fouls and hope to be successful, and that's what you're going to do because, let's face it, if you're going to be a playoff team in 4A, uh, there are no cupcakes. And even if you're finished second in th- this conference, you know, chances are good you're going to draw, you know, Newcastle or Blackhawk or somebody else that is just as good, if not better, than you are. And, you know, there's a lot of good teams. There's going to be... This, a very, very solid for a playoff field. And West Mifflin's going to have to, uh, you know, control the composure a little bit if they're going to be a part of that field. With Reed out, that's 900 yards and 16 touchdowns. So Gary Galeas, uh, uh, the quarterback, has to step up. Russell Tyree, Maurice Johnson, Darnell Carney, they have some depth uh, as far as the running game, but they're going to need to step up with Howie Reed out of the lineup. Matt Fine who's having a really good year until last week. Uh, Nick Hall running back, Tim Labuda, some of the weapons for Bell Vernon uh, to rebound. So both of these teams kind of looking to rebound on. The other good thing going in their favor is as far as clinching, along with TJ, Bell Vernon, and West Mifflin are in, mm-hmm. it is Ringgold who's on the outside looking in. But those teams already have clinched uh, the playoff berth. And unless Ringgold wins... Uh, Ringgold has a non-conference game, so it doesn't matter what they do this week. But if Trinity were to lose to Greensburg-Salem, Ringgold would clinch. But it will come down to next week's game between Ringgold and Trinity, likely for that final playoff spot in the Big Nine Conference. Northwest 9, South Fayette is in. They travel to Highlands to take on the Golden Rams, a preseason favored by some not to win the conference, but to make the playoffs. They are still alive, but a lot would need to happen, including an upset of the top-ranked Lions. Indiana is at Mars. The Fighting Planets are playoff-bound. Knock visits Ambridge. Bridger's just looking for a win. And Blackhawk at Montour. We're going to be um, talking uh, some Blackhawk Cougar football coming up with Joe Lomenza, but the Cougars uh, have a chance to clinch. Montour, uh, they are eliminated uh, with a loss at home. And again, like I mentioned with Highlands, there were some High hopes for Lucero's squad. Yeah, you, you you look at that, and they're not, they're not coming in on a good note. Mm-hmm. You lose 46-35 to Greensburg, Salem. Uh, Kayvon Mormon throws for 227 yards and three scores. Ran for a score, ran for a buck 35 in that win. But 
They've lost, uh, you know, two straight games now, and they are not operating on a good note against the Blackhawk team that has really, you know, we, we thought that Joe Lomenza would turn the program around <coughs> this year, and he's done so. A tremendous job by the coach. We'll talk to him a little bit about that. But uh, uh, the Cougars uh, just one step away from uh, making the ultimate goal of the playoffs. Yeah, this is a team that had just one win last year. They come in ranked number seventh as far number seven as far as the MSA for a top ten goes. And uh, uh, Blackhawk uh, on a little bit of a streak. They've won four of their last five games. Montour had started hot, and you mentioned high expectations. They won a three or four. You mentioned it, Mark, the two game losing streak. Polar opposite losses. They lose a defensive struggle, twelve to ten against Highlands. Last week, they go against Greensburg-Salem. They're winning into the fourth quarter. They give up 21 points. I had a note here saying both defenses had been good for both Blackhawk and Montour. Then I realized, well, he gave up 46 points in a come-from-behind loss to Greensburg-Salem. Maybe not so much uh, for the Montour Spartans. So uh, they need to kind of uh, pull it together as far as that goes because you mentioned it. They come up on the outside uh, uh, looking in, they uh, are searching for some answers. You mentioned Mormon, who's done a pretty good job at uh, quarterback. Braden Jones uh, is the leading rusher and also the leading scorer for Montour. But uh, you're coming up, it's a Blackhawk team. I mentioned that had eight losses and uh, took them a while to um, maybe you had a little Joe Hamilton hangover last year after being there 39 years. Uh, but uh, they're doing a good job. We're going to talk, as you mentioned, to Joe Lemenza. Uh, about some of his players more in depth, but uh, Cal Patterson or Cal Peterson, excuse me, and Spencer Hunter, a couple of players we're going to talk about. But you go from one and eight to getting into the playoffs. That's a good turnaround. Sometimes it that's all it takes is a year under a new coach. Mm-hmm. Sometimes a little longer. Sometimes it's just getting used to uh, the new coach and the way he does things. But uh, maybe a change of scenery in terms of conferences uh, also as well. Well, uh, you got rid of that uh, that Parkway thing, yeah. which was. Uh, well, that was a well, good, not that was the, a good the, conference. Not wasn't that it? this Northwest Nine's a walk in the well, park. This is true. But it's, it, it's not it the is not the Parkway Conference. You're but right. then many aren't the Parkway Conference. Non-conference uh, in in four A. It's uh, Newcastle hosting Ringgold. I want to, real quick. I want to throw something in on that one. Ringgold begin with Trinity. Newcastle possibly begin with Blackhawk Week Nine. For my money. Why on earth would you play anybody more than a quarter in this game? I mean, because this this game does not mean anything as far as well, that's the. But the coaches will tell you that's why they hate playing non conference games late. It does give you that opportunity that if someone's banged up, you don't have to play them. But at the same time, if you have some momentum, if you're playing well. You want to be in sync going to the playoffs, and if you sit there and start benching guys or resting starters, living in your fears, as some coaches would say, then um, then I think that they don't like that either. The one thing before we go to break, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned uh, Joe Lomenza was at Mohawk, so you got to know him there, Mark, um, before coming to Blackhawk, and you said that y- you know you knew when he made that move that he'd be successful. I mean, it, I, I color me surprised, to be honest with you. I mean, Joe did a nice job at Mohawk. And Blackhawk was down. I mean, the last few years under Coach Hamilton, they struggled mightily. Now, again, what we just talked about being in that, uh, that, that uh, war machine known as the Parkway Conference. But nonetheless, I, I, you know, I was su- somewhat surprised at the hiring and then um, – Pleasantly surprised at the quick turnaround. I think part of it, and I'm gonna, I will definitely ask Joe about this. The last couple of years under Coach Hamilton, the numbers weren't there, and when you're at a disadvantage in terms of the numbers, as opposed to yeah. some of the other teams in in, in that Parkway Conference, I, I really think that was a big uh, a, a big blow to the Cougars and. Uh, you know, Joe has done a very nice job down there, and he, you know, just brought some different ideas, and uh, you know, maybe just a different face, you know, a different face yep. to the program, different voice. And, and, and Coach Hamilton, you know, y- you can't disparage what he did because Joe Hamilton 
uh, one of the finest football oh, coaches uh, in, in the WPL. Third winningest in WPL history. No with, question without about Without question. It. But, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the uh, change, uh, cha- a change was needed. And, yep. you know, it was on Coach Hamilton's terms, and that was the best thing about it. We'll talk more Blackhawk football coming up. Hopefully hook up with Joe Lamenza and then afterward run down the 3A, 2A, and Class 1A schedules for Week 8. It's this week in the WPIL on the MSA Sports Network. I love how you remodeled the house. Thanks, Mom. Stakes are done. How did you two afford all of this? We got a great home equity loan at Dollar Bank. That's right. They have a rate as low as 2.59% APR with only $25,000 borrowed, fixed for seven years. All my idea. Uh huh. Your dad and I are looking to refinance, and that's one of the lowest rates yet. We really need to get our payments down. Give Dollar Bank a call. They'll help you save a lot of money. Just remember who gave you the idea. <laughs> oh, my. Talk to a Dollar Bank loan expert today. They're not paid a commission and only have your best interests in mind. Start saving money now. Refinance to one of the lowest rates around. 2.59% APR fixed for seven years. Longer terms are available. Stop by, call 1-800-242-BANK, or visit dollar.bank. Dollar Bank, mutually inspired. Rate is for well-qualified borrowers and includes a discount with a qualifying checking account. Not available for the refinance of a Dollar Bank loan, line, or mortgage of less than $15,000 in new money. Monthly payment of $13.03 per $1,000 borrowed. Other terms and conditions apply, subject to change without notice. Equal housing lender. People ask what drives me. It's the respect I have for my opponents, the trust I have in my teammates, a coach who treats me with dignity, and a university that has faith in me on and off the field. That's what keeps me focused why I practice harder, play my heart out. I play to win. I play for Carlo. Tell us your story using hashtag what drives you. Carlo University, a proud sponsor of the MSA Sports Network. Right now, when you refer a friend to open a new personal or business checking account at First Commonwealth Bank, you can earn a generous cash reward. It doesn't even have to be a friend. Could be a relative. Could be a Bruins fan. Could be that guy over there with the weird hair thing going on. It doesn't matter. Refer anyone to open an account and it will really pay off for you. They'll even get a cash reward themselves, no matter who they root for. First Commonwealth Bank, member FDIC. Learn more at a local branch or visit fcbanking.com. When looking to replace your athletic field, choose ProGrass first in turf. ProGrass has installed over 500 fields in the U.S. Getting the best artificial turf for your field depends on both the product and the partner you choose. That's why architects, athletic directors, and players choose the ProGrass Performance System. ProGrass maintains an active presence in the synthetic turf industry as members of the Sports Turf Management Association and the American Sports Builder Association and is proud to be recognized as the FIFA Preferred Manufacturer. Call ProGrass today, 866 866- 2706003 or visit them on the web at www.prograsturf.com prograss first in turf msasports.net is the place to click on every day this fall on mondays we have the latest msa sports top 10 football rankings also on monday we check in on the former district stars now making the grade in college with wpiaal alum q a Tuesday is a look back at the biggest and best plays from the previous Scholastic Football Weekend with the Plays of the Week. We go big game hunting on Wednesday with a preview of the top WPIEL football contests. I'll look into my crystal ball on Thursday with the wildly popular Chicks Picks. A complete rundown of all the games comes your way on Friday, plus plenty of broadcasts to choose from on Friday nights. On Saturday, we'll take a look at the top performances with Friday Night Highlights. Then on Sunday, a look back at the previous day's high school standouts with Saturday's Scholastic Stars. Anytime, anywhere, always there this fall with the MSA Sports Network at msasports.net. BSN Sports has joined the MSA Sports Network sponsorship family and will be featuring a weekly Coaches Game of the Week. This week's matchup is a 3A interstate conference fray between the Elizabeth Forward Warriors and the South Park Eagles. Winning coach will receive a shirt compliments of BSN Sports this week in the WPIL here on the MSA Sports Network. Seasoned veterans Mark Schoss and Bob Orquist here 
with myself, Don Rebel, will be running down the 3A, 2A, and 1A uh, slate as far as week eight is concerned. Coming up uh, shortly, but we're uh, kind enough to join us now, the head coach of the Blackhawk Cougars, Joe Lamenza. Joe is the uh, is the. I mean, do you need a lozenge for your second straight uh, media <laughs> appearance here tonight? No, but uh, but Bob Barrickman said that uh, he did one up you tonight, so he gave you a plug and and, and told me to tell you that he got you. Well, uh, yeah, he did, and uh, but I'll get him Friday. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I was going to ask you, do you? <clears throat> Do you want me to do the interview like Bob Barrickman? Because <laughs> I, I can don't. do it if it makes you feel a little more relaxed, Joe. <laughs> That's a pretty good impression. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, congratulations on, on what has been uh, um, a banner season thus far. I know that uh, still a lot of work to be done here in weeks eight and then next week. In week nine, uh, first to secure a playoff berth, but this is uh, this has been great not only probably for you and your staff, but also uh, these kids who have uh, who have struggled a bit through r- recent years. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and, uh, and 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 we're excited to be in this situation to have this opportunity. But uh, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we're not done yet. It's nice to have a winning season, but. Um, you know, we, we're excited to have the opportunity to compete for a playoff spot. And uh, I'm just happy for our players. They've worked so hard. And, and, and uh, you know, they, they, had, they had some tough seasons the last few years. And last year, you know, our first year here at Blackhawk was a tough season. And they, they battled back. And, and our players had a great off season and a great summer. And um, they're just working hard. And, and um, you know, like I said, we're excited to have the opportunity on Friday night that we have. You're now in your second year, as you just mentioned, at Blackhawk. They always say the old adage, you want to follow the guy who follows the guy who followed a legend. You didn't have that option. Uh, following in the footsteps of the great uh, Joe Hamilton and the storied career that uh, that he inked out in his years at Blackhawk. When you got that opportunity, did you feel the pressure of taking over for Coach Hamilton? You know what? I've been asked that question a lot of times, and and really, I didn't I didn't feel the I wouldn't call it pressure. It was more of more of a responsibility. You know, he he built a great program here. I know you know his last several years were certainly not his best years, and and um, so I, I guess it would have been a little a little bit different if I came in after a, after a WPL championship. But you know, his record speaks for itself, and. Um, Coach has been maybe the other part of it is coach has been such a just such a great mentor for me and and all the other coaches in the Beaver County area through our through our MAC Coaches Association. I've known Coach Hamilton for a long time and and um you know I'm I'm proud to be able to call him a friend and and to to follow in his footsteps and have that close relationship with him that bond with him. It was just an honor for me and uh, you know it's 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 made me work. Uh, it's motivated me to work even harder, you know, to live up to that standard that, that he set there. Mm. It, it, you know, it, you sort of took a, a lot of the starch out of my next question. I was going to ask, I guess, because the Cougars have struggled in that crazy Parkway Conference in Joe's last couple of years, it probably did make that that uh, takeover a little easier than if, as you mentioned, it was the mid-'90s and he was coming off a second or third straight WPIL championship. Yeah, and and you know what, he's been so gracious in that regard. You know, he, he and I have, have have gone to you know different social events and things together. And like I said, I've known him for a long time, and and he's been a great mentor for me. And anytime anyone wants to, any any time that question comes up, he's usually the first one to chime in and say, "Hey, listen, there's no pressure here." Um, he's just been so gracious about that, and and I'm very grateful. For that and to have that uh, the relationship with him and the bond that I have with him, you know, there's only been three coaches at Blackhawk in Blackhawk history, mm. and uh, so it's it's a unique situation here. It's a special school, it's a special program, and I'm just I'm just proud of it, to be a part of it. When you think about that, do you think okay, now as long as I don't totally screw this thing up, I'm good to go here for a while? Uh, you know what? I, I really don't think about it in those terms. <laughs> I just do the. I, I do the best job that I can, and that's what we ask of our players. You know, work hard. Don't let anybody outwork you. 
and, and just try to get better every day. And, and during the season and the off season, that, that's been that's kind of been my my mantra, you know, in coaching. I just I just try to do the best I can, work hard, and uh, and and I think when you do that, good things will happen. And yeah, we were just talking before the break, uh, Mark and, and Bobby and I about uh, you know not having to deal with the Parkway Conference anymore, but but then I chimed in, hey, you know, this Northwest Conference isn't a, a walk in the park either. And, and, and really, when you open up the paper on Saturday mornings and you see blowout, 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 up and down the six classifications, and you look at what you guys have done, win or lose, man, you have been in some very competitive games. So at this point, I would think nothing's going to really spook you guys. Well, we just we just got to continue to get better every week. You know, we've been in some close games, and it's it's just different. The the Parkway is is no longer here, and and uh, the, the 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 new Northwest Nine Conference is here. Um, the, the teams are different. You know, the, the old rivalries aren't there anymore, but new rivalries will probably develop out of this. And I tell you what, the one thing that really stands out to me in our conference, and, and you kind of alluded to it, is there seems to be a lot of parity in our conference. You know, if you look not just in, in the games that we've played, but if you look at the scores every week, right. in most weeks across the conference, the games have been very close. And uh, so it's a, it's a lot of fun to, to, to coach in and um, – and like I said, I expect new rival rivalries will develop. It's kind of strange for us because the only Beaver County team that we play now is Ambridge. Mm. So you know, before we were playing a lot of Beaver County teams, and you had those local rivalries. But this is the new normal. It is what it is, yeah. and, it's, and it's new for everyone. And in and, and rivalries, you know, up and down sports, it, it, it's not necessarily a provincial thing. It's not necessarily okay. Well, we have this school district as a neighbor and this school district as a neighbor, so that's a rivalry. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but now with the, the expansion and everything, a lot of times rivalries can be born with just you know two teams that maybe don't have a great history, but all of a sudden every time they're playing, it, it, it turns into a humdinger. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, how those, that's how rivalries come about. It's, it, sometimes it's, it's geography, but... You know, what makes a good rivalry is when the teams are both pretty good and the games are competitive every year. And, you know, if there's something on the line, you know, that just adds to it. But, you know, it's the teams and the history between the teams that, that make a rivalry. Uh, you know, I don't want to be a Donnie negative here. And we had Greg Perry from Keystone Oaks on earlier. And, and, and I sort of was the, one of the first games I brought up was the, the loss. They only have one loss, and it was the loss, that wild shootout to Beaver, uh, you guys come in to this week at Montour, big game with a 5-2 and two record. But I want to talk about one of those games that you did not come out on the winning end, and that was the South Bayette game. You guys had the lead. They come back, pull off the victory. I, I know as a coach and your staff, you probably got together either Friday night or Saturday, and you know you weren't happy with the end result, but – you know, once you start thinking about it a little further or maybe a little further removed, you you start to realize, you know, hey, we played toe-to-toe with one of the elite teams in this classification. Why not us? Yeah. Well, that game, you're right, that game was a tough pill for all of us to swallow. Um, you know, our players played a great game. They executed the game plan, and – um you know, we just got to find a, win, a way to win those games, and that's that's really the next phase for us. Um, you know, a team like South Fayette. Anytime you play a great team, they're going to battle back. They're not just going to they're not just going to lay down for you. And um, you know, they made plays in critical situations, and we didn't. So, I'm not I'm not too into the moral victories, um, but but I would characterize that game as a step in the right direction for us. But we got to find a way to win those close games um, and come out on top. You know, when we have the lead. Joe Lamenza, second-year coach of the Blackhawk Cougars, one of the great turnaround stories around the WPIL in this 2016 season. Four and two in the Northwest Nine Conference, five and two overall. One went away from clinching a playoff berth after a one-win season in 2014. We're getting you ready for Week Eight. One of the marquee matchups is Blackhawk at Montour here on the MSA Sports Network. It's this week in the WPIAL. Don Rebel, Bob Orquist, and here is Mark Shaws. Joe, I said before you came on, I, I was not surprised that Blackhawk uh, 
you know, has has shown what they have this year that have made so, you know a strong move, you know, into playoff contention into this Northwest Nine Conference. Talk about how difficult it was uh, during the off season. You get the kids to work, and now you have. It looks like you've got the numbers too that you're able to start really building a program at Blackhawk again. Yeah, you know, our numbers are up. We had we have 82 on the team right now. That's a testament to our players. Um, I, I've said this a number of times to a number of people. Obviously, last year was a tough year for all of us. It was a transition year. Um, you know, those kids had played for Coach Hamilton for three or four years, those seniors. And um, we came in late in the spring. I think I got hired at the end of April. And, uh, they, you know, they really bought into what we were doing. And, and I, I give a lot of credit to last year's seniors. They they uh, kept the ship together. And if you came to our practices the last week of the season, you wouldn't have known if we were 8-0 and or, or uh, 0-8. And uh, the hard work and perseverance paid off. We finished the season with a win, and we were, we were able to use that as a springboard this off season. And uh, I, I give a lot of I give all the credit to the seniors this year. Seniors, we have a great senior class. They set the standard. You know, going back to January when we started our off-season program, attendance was was near perfect. You know, other than guys that play other sports and some vacations here and there, and and uh, that dovetailed into the summer. And and uh, you know, we've just tried to work hard and get better every week. That's kind of been our our mantra. Talk to me a little bit about your quarterback, Michael Slavis. Slav- Sifliski, yeah, I can say it, right. but uh, he's doing a very nice job running your offense. Uh, three for three touchdowns last week against Highlands. Uh, threat both throwing and running the football. Yeah, M- Mike's a hell of a player. Last year, um, you know, he was competing for the job. When I came in, I was evaluating personnel, and uh, Mike and, and another senior we're competing for the quarterback job and we sat down and talked to those guys and explained to them that this was going to be a competition and that regardless of how it turned out, you know, the other guy was going to be expected to contribute. So Mike, uh, Mike was, was not only learning a new system last year, but, but he was, you know, competing for a job. So this off season, he had the job, um, you know, there was no competition. He was going to be our guy. He knew that. So he could just focus on uh, getting better at, at the little things, getting better at running our offense, and, and we started with our quarterback workouts in the winter, and and uh, he's worked really, really hard, and, and he's proven to be a uh, a great dual threat, you know, as a runner and a passer. What kind of connection does he have with Tyler Hill? So he's only got twenty two catches, but seven touchdowns. Yeah, Ty- Tyler's a, another great athlete, very versatile. Uh, we do a lot of things with Tyler in, in the passing game, in the running game, and. Um, those two guys work well together. And, you know, and it's not just those guys. It, it, it starts with the offensive line. You know, Mike's got to have the pass protection to get those balls off. And, you know, the other receivers have to run the right routes. And, and, and all those things contribute to, to Tyler being able to get open. And he had a great game last week. I think Tyler had uh, all three of our touchdowns. So, um, you know, those guys are working well together. They all are as a unit. The Cougars are only allowing 19 points a game. Obviously, you guys preach defense a lot. Talk to me a little bit about your defense. Well, that that was a point of emphasis for us this off season. Obviously, I think last year, I can't remember exactly what the statistics were, but uh, you know, we we had to get better at defense, and and for us, that's where everything starts with. You know, we start with defense. Um, that that's that's what we focus on the most in our off season preparation. Our players have to know. Our players know from day one. You know, defense is going to be our priority. Um, and I know it's an, I know it's cliche, but um, defense is what wins championships. So we worked really hard on our defense uh, starting in the off season and into the summer, and um, you know it's something that we work hard on and focus on every day. And you look at uh, just the, the Northwest Nine in general; uh, it's a very tough conference. Uh, handicap your opposition this week, the Montour Spartans. Say that one more time, Mark. Handicap the Spartans this week. Uh, what are we? What are you looking for from Montour? Oh wow, Montour is a great team, and uh, they always have been. Uh, they're uh, historically they've been a, a playoff and a, and a championship contender every year. Um, they're well coached, and Lou does a great job. 
and they've been here before. They've been in this situation, and, and I think they're pretty good in all three phases of the game. They have a great running game. Quarterback is very athletic. Uh, defensively, they really get after it. They make plays in the kicking game. So we're going to have our hands full this week. This will be a great challenge for us. This week in the WPIL, Joe Lemenza of the Blackhawk Cougars, our guest, Mark Schoss, turning it over to Bob Orquist. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Mark. Hey, Coach, uh, when you look at film and you're talking with uh, your team during practice this week, uh, do you do you get into specifics like Montour had won three or four, but they lost two straight? Do you say, don't look at this team as a team that lost two straight because you just talked about how good they are? Is that something yeah. that you try to reinforce? Absolutely, all the time. We don't we don't want to get into that game. We don't want to look at you know this game and say, okay, well this team beat that team, so now you know it means this is going to happen. It, it's never like that in the sport of football. And the minute you think that, you're going to be in trouble. Um, you know, we have a lot of respect for Montour. We, you know, we know their history. Montour's always been a, a big rivalry game. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have our hands full this week. They're they're a really good team, and uh, we don't really pay much attention to to what happened the week before, you know, with our opponents or our own team. You know, all that matters is, is this week. And, uh, you know, anything that happened last week, good, bad, or otherwise, isn't going to help you at all this week. Um, that sort of took some of the steam out of my next question. Uh, not to rehash the 28-21 loss to South Fayette, which you and Don talked about, but you get a field goal with 10 seconds left to get a 25-22 win over Highland. So, uh, is that a high that carries over, or was it just get back to shower that off, win or lose, business as usual? Well, you know, I mean, it it, it always feels good to win, and um, you know, may, maybe there's a momentum factor there. You know, that's hard to quantify, but um, for us, it's more about you know being able to find a way to win the close games, and that, that's something that we talk about. I think you know, historically, good teams. Uh, find a way to win close games. They, they they win on the road. They win late in the year. Those are all characteristics of good football teams. So you know we'll we'll take that for what it's worth. And uh, you know and, and maybe there's a momentum factor there. I don't know. But but win or lose, we need to be able to turn the page. And I'll be honest with you, we didn't play real well last week. And I tip my hat to to Highlands. We made a ton of mistakes in that game we turned the ball over we had a lot of penalties and most of the time when you do those things against a good team like highlands you're not going to come out on top but our kids rose to the, the occasion late in the game and we found a way to win and, and we were real proud of the, the players for that and um you know if we can build on that great but you know we just got to get ready for month and get better at the mistakes that we made you and mark had talked a little bit about uh mike Savaliski and uh Tyler Hill, Kyle Peterson had a good game for you last week, and uh, lead your team in rushing. Talk a little about, about Kyle and how he has performed this year. Oh, Kyle's a tough back. He uh, he's a big back. He's fast, athletic, catches the ball well, has good vision. Um, I, I can't say enough about him. And then Alex Desmond too. We we have a, a pretty good one-two punch there. Uh, both of those backs. Last time I checked, average about six point two or six point three yards of carry. So. Um, they complement each other really well, but Cal did have a good game last week. He's a he's a hard runner, tough, hard nosed kid, and um, I'm glad he's on our team. So you have two running backs at six plus for carry. That speaks to good offensive line play. Talk a little bit about the guys up front for you. Yeah, it all starts with the offensive line on any team, and uh, we have a good group there. We have a veteran group there. It's uh, it's made up of four seniors and, and uh, one sophomore actually, and uh, those guys have, have really gelled. They've come together as a unit. They're really smart, you know, which allows us to to do some different things and make some in in game adjustments when we have to. So, um, we're really getting after it this year. So we are talking about the turnaround from one win you mentioned it, the win in the last week of the season, to uh, a chance to potentially clinch a playoff spot, and I know. Uh, as far as the standard goals, uh, you want to clinch a playoff spot, you look for the conference championship. Uh, talk about that. Has that been one of the goals? And did you tell the guys or will you tell the guys this week, look, we take care of business against Montour on Friday. Check that off our goal list. Well, that, that's the situation. It is what it is. It's, it's, it's no secret. You know, Montour knows it. We know it. You know, we're expecting a playoff-like atmosphere up there. I, I think the situation is if we win, we're in and, and if Montour loses, they're, I think, mathematically out. So 
uh, you know, we're expecting a playoff-like atmosphere. It's going to be a tough game. But we're excited to have that opportunity. You know, we're happy with with the winning season. But, you know, our goal with Blackhawk is always to compete for and win championships. I mean, that's the standard around here. That's what we're shooting for. But, you know, we got to take it one game at a time. And right now, that, that one game is Montour. So you did very good, Coach. Either you, Bob Barrickman either mentioned that or you were looking at our website because Cougars clinch with a win at Montour. Montour needs two wins and some help to get in. So very good as far as knowing the playoff scenario. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Trust me, he got that off our website. He didn't get that off Barrickman. <laughs> Hey, well, Joe. Since I'm talking to you guys, yeah, I got it off. <laughs> Before we uh, we let you go, it has been a, no- a long night for you. Um, we, you know, we're talking about the great things that you're doing with this Blackhawk Cougar program, and I know that's your total focus. But you got to sort of have an eye on your old stomping grounds. The the Mohawk Warriors are struggling, having lost their last 17 in a row, and I know you. You and a lot of us would like to see that uh, them throw up a W to get rid of that uh, monkey off their back. Yeah, you know, I, I I still have some friends over there, obviously, as you as you could probably assume. Um, yeah, you know, I, that that's tough. I know what that's like. We've all had those seasons, those kinds of seasons before. Hell, you know, I, we had one last year here at Blackhawk. Those are those are tough seasons to get through and. I know those guys are working hard, and, and I think if they stick with it, their hard work will pay off. So, Well, Joe, your hard work is paying off. The Cougars on the brink of a playoff berth uh, at Montour on the network Friday, then closing out at home against Newcastle, also on MSA Sports. Uh, we appreciate your time. We know, again, it's been a, a busy well, night with uh, our good friends at uh, WBVP and uh, congratulations uh, on the on the success and finish it off. Get into the uh, postseason again for all the the Blackhawk Cougar fans. Thanks, guys. I, uh, we really appreciate it. On behalf of the team, we appreciate it. And uh, thanks for having me on. All right, Joe. Take care. All right, you too. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, Joe Lamenza, in his second year at Blackhawk. <clears throat> One win a year ago, five and two, going into a big game Friday in which they can clinch. Uh, at Montour in Class 4A's Northwest 9 Conference. And you mentioned that uh, final game of the year with uh, Newcastle. I'll get a chance to see the Cougars in action, and that one uh, should be a uh, very good matchup. Shameless the... plug forthcoming here. On the, the when, network. When did Sam Hall walk into the network here? I mean, in the well, I, I learned from the best. You know, <clears throat> I, I was with Sam on the round table a couple weeks ago, so always plug yourself first. Uh, okay. so, but make yeah. sure, make sure that uh, you know what what Joe has done down there is just yeah. a, a fantastic job. But uh, I have a feeling you're going to lead us into a uh, another fantastic game here momentarily. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there is always a game of the week in Class 3A's Beaver Valley Conference. It's almost like semifinals now. It's like a college football feel. You got Aliquip at Central Valley, which we'll talk about in a moment this week. Then next week, you got Beaver, Beaver Falls. Basically, it comes down to, outside of anything really strange happening, the two winners of those games are going to clinch a playoff berth. I, I still think this this conference will produce a wild, one of the two wild card teams. But uh, Aliquippa at Central Valley, and and you look at <laughs> is that all that's is that really, all that needs that's to be really said? All you need to say right there. <laughs> well, let's put it this way, okay? You look at what happened to Central Valley last week. Yeah, running out of time, and uh, yep. you know, and, and you just just like Beaver ran out of time, and yeah, precisely. I mean, it's just a different, it's a different ending every week. But it's a, uh, you know, you know, you keep rotating the number one teams in Class Three A every week because every yep. week there's a new team, and, and they're rotating at number one. We we talked about Aliquippa Claret in that dream matchup from a few weeks ago, but it was non conference, didn't mean anything. This also, I think, could fall into a dream match. First of all, Center Aliquippa had the great rivalry. They always met in Week 9. Center High School, of course, merging with Monaco to form Central Valley. That high school has had nothing but success. Aliquippa, of course, has had great success over the last four decades. 
Um, so this is also sort of a, a, a dream matchup. And when these two team and the line, when the lineman came out, you all, that was one of the things I thought of first of all was, you know, Aliquippa Central Valley. Well, there's no question about that. Uh, and two great coaches, Mark Lyons, Mike Smianic, uh, getting at it. Uh, number four, Aliquippa, number three, Central Valley. And you just, uh, align the winner here gets a playoff spot. So they can breathe a little easier in week yeah. nine than uh, the other teams uh, who might not be in because it's coming down to that. But, yeah, that's one of the things I looked at when we got reclassified is the fact that now Equipa plays up. And then here you got a Central Valley program who's been dynamite over the last uh, seasons uh, in its history, really, in Class AAA. And now you got Al Equipa, 6-2 and two for both of these teams, 4-1 and one for Central Valley, 3-1 and one for the Quips. Both average over 35 points a game, almost equal as far as uh, points allowed, 17.3 uh, for the Warriors, 18.1 for the Quips. Uh, Avante McKenzie leading the way as far as running the football for uh, the Al Equipa fighting Quips. He had a, a big game last week in a 34-7 win uh, a pair of touchdowns over Quaker Valley. Uh, Nico Battisti doing a good job from the quarterback position for Central Valley. Threw for 246 yards and two touchdowns. And one would think with a little luck, clock management, maybe maybe a different story last week, but a huge victory for Beaver Falls nonetheless. And you just it's almost like being in the Parkway Conference. You need to gear up yep. every week. In the Beaver Valley Conference. There's no doubt the uh, Beaver Valley Conference is now the new parkway as far as uh, every game is just, uh, uh, it's just such a meat grinder, especially with these four teams. And then you throw the additional uh, caveat, because in the parkway, you know, if this was the old parkway, all four of these teams would be in the playoffs. True. You have the top four teams in 3A. One of which is not in. is not going to make the playoffs, and you know you 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 look at that, and a couple of other kids you want to mention for Central Valley is Danny uh, Santia, uh, mm-hmm. thirteen touchdowns so far in the season. He has done a very nice job. A lot of passes from Batisti as well, <laughs> and then uh, you know Davian Jones and Tariq Jones, a uh, couple of guys that uh, both. Uh, quite capable of carrying the football for the Aliquip Equips. Maybe the Quips, though, it's... You, 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 to use the Tomlin line, the standard is the standard. Well, uh, the standard, you know, championships are the standard at Aliquip. And, uh, Isn't the standard the standard at Central Valley, too? Absolutely. So, but you, yeah. so you're looking at the, a situation where, you know, maybe the Quips are a hair removed from what, what they have been over the last couple of years. But the competition brings a lot into that too. That's Coach Tomlin, Mark. By the way, McKenzie and Jones, comma, Davian right. over 1,600 yards rushing on the season for Alec Let, Let's see how well he coaches up with Landry Jones at quarterback. <sighs> well, the standard is the standard. I didn't say he was a deity. I just said it was Coach <laughs> Tomlin. Well, I, you, treat, <clears throat> you 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 kind of referred to him in those tones. Hopewell at Beaver Falls, the bottom falling out for Hopewell after a great start. They hit the meat of their schedule and they have struggled. They are at uh, Reeves Field at Thank Geneva you. College in Beaver Valley Conference action on Friday. The uh, 3A Interstate Conference, Elizabeth Forward at South Park. Both teams still alive for a playoff berth. That's our BSN Sports Game of the Week. South Moreland visits Yawk. Waynesburg is at Derry. The Trojans still undefeated. Allegheny Conference talked about Keystone Oaks, Freeport, Bobby Tro- O. Trojans, by the way, have this next to them as well as Interstate Conference champions. That's right. Champions, that's right. They're, they're, they're the only team that's clinched. They're the only team. You're right. The only and they've clinched in. the conference title, not only a playoff berth. Keystone Oaks hosting Freeport. Shady Side Academy at Deer Lakes and... Apollo Ridge at Valley. Uh, the Valley quietly has hung in there, and um, they will close the season against uh, uh, Freeport, I believe, um, next week. But they have a big one at home. Uh, Muzzy Calissimo and company at Apollo or hosting Apollo Ridge. 3A non conference, Seton LaSalle takes on Quaker Valley. Also in 3A non conference, Beaver at Mount Pleasant. Both are. 
probably going to be playoff teams. This is a conference game for Beaver, and that's a long trek <laughs> from Beaver County to Westmoreland County for that game against a pretty good Vikings team. So we'll see what the uh, Bobcats can do in that situation. But it is a nice view from the press box, though, if you watch the local news, uh, just shooting across uh, the uh, Mount Pleasant uh, logo uh, out there. It's always very nice. Darius Rise is, is, is running to Mount Pleasant as we speak. <laughs> he probably yeah, he is what, what, carrying what, a torch. What's he at, what's he at 70, 80, 150 touchdowns right now? He's, it's, just, he's, he's put just up tremendously ridiculous numbers. Tremendous against a, it's a good Mount Pleasant team, so I think it's a good uh, it's a good matchup, even more so that you mentioned, because yeah. it counts as a conference game for Beaver. 3A versus 2A. Burrow is at East Allegheny. McGuffey against Chartiers, Houston, and Elwood City against Riverside. One of those rival games. It means nothing as far as the conference is concerned. It's been a tough season for Elwood City, great season for Riverside. They're they're playoff bound. But it's good to see one of those rivalries kept intact uh, through this non-conference game. And trust me, there is nothing that would make the fine folks at Lincoln High happier than to uh, put a loss on uh, their crosstown rivals, the Riverside Panthers. And, hey, uh, Ron Shiro, the head coach of the Panthers, he knows m- more about it than anyone, you know, playing Elwood City over the years. That's, that is going to be uh, – I think that's going to be a little bit closer than you think, especially with the weather forecast that, uh, in for the beautiful Elwood City area. Two A Century Conference, Burgettstown at Washington. This would have been a big game had Burgettstown not lost a lead at home to Charleroi on Saturday. Thus, Washington in good shape to win this conference outright with a victory at home against the Blue Devils. Charleroi still alive, even though they only picked up their first conference win of the year last week. They are at Beth Center, and Frazier visits Bentworth. In the Midwestern Athletic Conference of 2A, Laurel at New Brighton, Nishanik at Freedom, Mark will have the call of that one, and Southside Beaver visits Cardinal World North Catholic. That game also on the network. 3A3 Rivers Co- or 2A3 Rivers Conference, Carlinton at Brentwood, Sarah Catholic at Steel Valley, and South Allegheny at Avonworth, Steel Valley. Very impressive in destroying a good East Allegheny team in the showdown last week. Uh, one win away from clinching the conference championship. All right, Class A, Big 7 Conference on Friday, Rochester at Union. Shenango visits Our Lady of the Sacred Heart. Storox is at Cornell. And uh, on Saturday, Northgate against Summit Academy. Has, has there been any word? I know Cornell switched their game last week to an afternoon. Are they doing the same thing this week? Is that I don't believe so. I okay. have not heard anything. I haven't seen anything on it either. Right. Uh, in the Eastern Conference, all the games are Saturday. Clareton at Riverview. The new look A team will be in Oakmont for that one. Greensburg Central Catholic against Bishop Canavan. That one to close out week eight Saturday night. And Springdale visits Imani Christian. Wait, wait a minute here. At historic Grand, Grand Field. Field in Wilkinsburg. Uh, the new look A team. Just saying. I'm just reading the script here. Well, I just want the script says. You sent me. You sent me flying into my email. To... <laughs> I'm just ah, Majeski in there. That's right. The Zadie gotta, note. Everybody get. It's a rotation now. It's it's just a whoever gets the short end. You better be careful, work with. It could be you someday. Can Clareton take care of business and not overlook to that? Uh, yes. Jeanette matchup. In a word. Yes. Just, just to guess. Yes. Tri-County South, oh, we don't talk about big games in the Tri-County South that often, but the conference title is at stake. A pair of unbeaten teams in the conference, including one that's unbeaten for the season. Fort Cherry at Carmichael's. 7-0, 5-0 for the Rangers, 6-1, 6-0 for the Mighty Mikes. And you mentioned it, the winner is the conference champion. Uh, both coming off uh, impressive victories against Maybe lesser comp- competition. Jonathan Christopher, a couple of touchdowns and threw for a score. Carmichael's 46 to nothing, took care of business over Jefferson Morgan and Ryan Colbertson. He's been a big addition to oh. this Fort Cherry team. He ran for a score, he passed for another, and he gets the hat trick. He caught a pass for a third score as uh, Fort Cherry defeated Mapletown by a score of 48 to 8. Colbertson is <coughs> over. 
16, let me see, 6, and uh, where's my number at? That's the wrong number. So Do you six, want me to sing, uh, 12, sing six, a show tune again? No, 1,200 no. yards of offense, 16 touchdowns. Uh, uh, came there and just moved into the quarterback slot, and there's the dual threat. Uh, same for Christopher, dual threat for Carmichael, as we talked about it earlier. The dual threat quarterbacks, you got a pair of good ones going at it in this game. Yeah, because you get uh, – you look at just it for Cherry. I mean, uh, Brady Whalen threw two touchdown passes in a run last week. Uh, you got Scott Miller, who's quite capable <coughs> of putting points on the board. It's a Rangers team uh, that's averaging 40 points a game. Uh, they're very, very, very successful offensively. For for Carmichael's five straight wins after non-conference loss to Ocean Week 2, and uh, you talked a little bit about Christopher, and uh, you, know, you got Christopher, Joey Miner, and uh, Cody Brown all averaging 77 yards per carry when they rush the football. So, uh, you know, I think we're going to see some offensive firepower in this game. Also, Brennan uh, Pelzer in there as well for the Mighty Mikes. And uh, interesting, because if you look at the numbers, we talked about the records. They're combined 13-1. and one. Neither has lost in conference. And uh, 32.9 for Carmichael's 13.4 against. 40 for the Rangers, 12.6 against. So, it's kind of even, Steven. It'll be interesting to see if Colbertson is the difference maker of your four chair. You hope so, or if someone else steps up, maybe Christopher for the Mighty Mikes. I'm, I'm not going to promise that things have changed to the point that the Tri County South is going to enjoy, you know, great success in the postseason. But I think for the first time in a while, some Beth Center teams, I think, maybe fall in that category. But you're not looking to see the Tri County South champion as the six team and the runner up as the or the seven and eight teams. Where was Frazier at last year? Oh, I want to say f- fourth. I'm thinking fourth, maybe. No, you can. I'll look it up if you sing a show tune. Okay. Well, I will say I think they're, the whoever wins this game wins the conference and will be fourth. You still have Clareton, Jeanette, and Rochester. Um, as the big three in the classification. But um, there's no throw in this conference a bone. I think that's a legitimate four, whoever wins this game. And, and you bring up a good point too, Don, and it's maybe one to discuss next week, but since we might not be here next week, uh, do you put Clareton and Jeanette one, two? With, uh, yes. Even if one... <laughs> in a word? Yes. Even if one... Blows the other out? Blows the other out? Cause you're yeah, right. because really, I mean, 2-3, there's no difference. So if you want to put I, Rochester I 2 and the loser of Clareton Jeanette 3, okay, that's fine. But I, I think, you know, they met in the championship a year ago in Class A, and, and they've been really destroying everybody. Not that Rochester hasn't, but um, I, I think they're 1-2. The thing is, though, I'm just wondering if maybe people are so focused on Clareton and Jeanette, they've kind of forgotten that Rochester can, is a very good football team, and just because they've had they haven't had playoff success for a while, haven't been to the postseason, that uh, you know maybe the magic, oh, I, I don't maybe think the anybody's overlooking them. Yeah, I, I think that I'd be shocked if they're not a semifinal team. I would agree with in that. In one A. Got us, Robert? Frazier was a four. Yeah. And so, again, Fort Cherry Carmichael's the winner will be a four, and but I, I think a, a legit four. The other two in the TCS games Friday, Jefferson Morgan in California, Moness and Adavella, the Greyhounds uh, close to losing or missing the playoffs for a third straight year. That hasn't happened in a long time. A couple of non-conference games. I forgot to mention the 2A non-conference, Vincentian Academy at Mohawk. It's because... Maybe I forgot because neither team has a win. Good chance for that streak to end in Bessemer. Huh? <laughs> 2A versus 1A. It's a certainty. Brownsville is at Leechburg. Two more teams looking for their first win. So I like these kind of matches. I hate when long streaks continue from one season to another. 1A non-conference. Jeanette at Mapletown. And no, Jeanette will not look past Mapletown. And Western Beaver is at West Green. And West Green still alive for a playoff berth in the Tri-County South, even though this is a non-conference game. All right, uh, just general thoughts as we put uh, 
this one to bed, Bob Orquist and Mark Schatz. Stretch run is an exciting time. And again, it's really, we talked about this. This is my second uh, this week, second appearance on this week in the WPL. We talked about it earlier in the year with uh, um, one of the coaches, Mount Pleasant. Uh, oh, I got to look it up. Um, Bo Ruffner. Yeah, Bo Ruffner. And we talked about uh, the the... 3A situation and it's just you've got four teams and one of them one of the good teams is not going to be in the playoffs and that sticks out. I'm not sure if there's a there's a good remedy. Although potentially uh, the week zero yeah conference I mean, game is a and sixteen teams is a remedy. Again, that's not an ideal situation because you're talking about a week after camp opens, you're playing a True. conference game, but. I think that the, the three A coaches well, would take you, that in lieu of them, eight more playoff teams. Could you give them an extra extra time in camp? Yeah. Well, there is a isn't there a PIAA rule? You have to have X amount of days before. Well, the only thing is you have to do the heat acclimation, which yeah. means right. no contact. You can wear the pads, but no. Right. You know, you can't actually have practice until that opening day of camp. That uh, that being said, it's. It's always one of the most exciting times of the year when you get, you know, the opening of a season where everyone has uh, optimism and hope, and then you get at this time of the year where people have hope because you mentioned it, teams still alive, so mm-hmm. there's still something to play for uh, in week number eight. And, and you have conference championships to be decided, but you you also have, especially in two A and one A, with the six classifications, maybe some teams that haven't been to the playoffs for a while. Or in Olsh's case, have been to the playoffs ever, yeah. ever, you know, where they're 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 shooting for a playoff spot, and uh, I think that's a good thing to see too, and especially from my point of view, where you know that's mostly what I see is one A and two A games. So you know, I I like to see those teams, you know, some new teams have have an opportunity to get into the postseason. Well, thanks to Chris Lackner for doing double duty, producing uh, both the soccer pairing show and this week in the WPIAL. Thanks to Joe Lomenza from uh, Black Hockey, did some double duty himself. Greg Perry from Keystone Oaks, a very enjoyable show. Thanks to Mark Schaas and Bob Orquist pulling double duty here this evening. Uh, they will both be at respective games on Friday night, one of, uh, say, 35 games. At msasports.net, we'll get you started with the pregame show at 6 o'clock, and then afterward, don't forget the scoreboard show. A lot of people like it now because not only do you get the scores, you also get what's going on as far as playoff clinchings are concerned. The abacus will be in full working force. I'm you Don might Rebel. need it, by the way. Thanks for tuning in to this week in the WPIL on the MSA Sports Network.